Welcome all of you to this live program, Dr. Billy Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Sharik Bishai from Detroit, Michigan, United States. Dr. Bishai continued his professional training, completed the orthopedic residency at the Henry Ford Macomb Hospital in Clinton Township, Michigan, and participating in orthopedic sports medicine fellowship at the Plancher Orthopedics and Sports Medicine in New York City. During his fellowship, he also spent time at the Stedman Philippine Clinic in Vail, Colorado. He's also board certified in sports medicine. Dr. Bishai serves as an associate master instructor for the Arthroscopy Association of North America and regularly instructs orthopedic surgeons on improving their arthroscopic skills. He is board certified by the American Osteopathic Board of Orthopedic Surgery and the American Osteopathic Association. Recently, he was awarded the distinction of fellow of the Arthroscopy Association of North America. He serves as an assistant professor for the Michigan State University College of Osteopathic Medicine in East Lansing and also assistant professor for Oakland University William Beaumont Hospital School of Medicine, Rochester, Michigan. Currently, he's the chair of the Orthopedic Video Theater Committee for the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. He has been the past president of the American Osteopathic Academy of Orthopedic Sports Section and also the Detroit Academy of Orthopedic Surgery. He's a co-chair of the Sports Medicine Certificate of Added Qualification Committee for the AO, AO. So today is my great honor to introduce you to Dr. Sherry Bishai from Michigan, United States. Over to you, Dr. Bishai. Thank you. I really appreciate, first of all, allowing me to come on this uh, webcast. And I'm very excited because this is a topic I'm uh, passionate about. Uh, the glenoid bone loss has really become a hot topic over the last few years. And understanding the true treatment of glenoid bone loss is evolving, but I think it's starting, starting to really change. And I think the pendulum is going to move a little bit. Uh, and the dogmatic approach we've taken in the past, I think, is going to uh, change to doing more bone block type procedures. So let's begin. These are my disclosures. Just let's start simple. It's the most uh, dislocated joint in the body with 95% of shoulder dislocations being anterior. And the younger we are at the time of our first dislocation, the more likely the, the recurrence and re-dislocation. And these change, uh, the rate re changes as we get older, there's going to be a less chance of uh, recurrence. So it's really important that when we see these patients, we treat them. Uh, in years past, it's been treating them non-operatively. There's been a big push for first-time dislocators to be treated surgically. Uh, that's not the scope of this talk, but I think it's important to Remember that as we head into why do we get so much bone loss later on during this uh, process. And again, 50 to 80% of patients, if they have their first dislocation under 20, are going to have another dislocation. I think it's important to truly understand the types of instability. There's the old school, the tubs and the ambry, tubs being the more traumatic, and then the ambry being the atraumatic. These are going to be the multi-directional uh, patients. And it's really important to take this into account because the treatment may be different based on the type of instability the patient has. You can see over here how much pain this patient is in, and this one's actually smiling. So it's a different, uh, it's a different animal. So we have to make sure that we understand the instability so therefore we can appropriately treat it. And again, over the last few years, there's been this push to really understand the different types. And today we're really gonna talk about this traumatic and structural uh, these are the, going to be the ones that tend to have more bone loss and are going to be treated more symptomatically uh, versus the ones that are uh, secondary to atraumatic or muscle patterning issues. While doing this, however, I think it's important to always make sure you understand the, uh, if the patient is hyperlax, utilizing Brighton criteria and Baton uh, scores, as this is really going to give us an indication of uh, the art of this, these procedures of really understanding how, how tight to make some of these patients, because if they are hyperlax, they will get looser. So you really need to know what the patient is from the standpoint of laxity, but also uh, what they're trying to get back because you're going to treat a thrower differently, maybe than uh, a different type of collision athlete. And again, when you're looking in the operating room, I think it's important to continue to diagnose while in the operating room. And here you see this labrum that looks okay, but then it falls off at the six o'clock position and you have this big patchless capsule and capacious joint. So I think when you see something like that, and you can see even with just a little bit of distraction, that humeral head is completely off the glenoid. And anytime that you're doing this diagnostic arthroscopy and you can see all the way posterior 
and you can see the labrum posteriorly and even the posterior neck, you have to presume that you have a very loose shoulder. And again, when we see something like this that comes into the office, it's, uh, it's important to note this is a glenoid fracture and not a bony bank heart. These are treated differently. These are going to be treated more like a, a true fracture, whether you're going to do this open or arthroscopic. But this is a different, uh, a whole different diagnosis than that would be of a bony bank heart injury. And even when you see something like this, and this is actually a patient that just came in recently to see me and uh, had this injury about six weeks prior and unfortunately went to the uh, emergency department where x-rays were taken. But unfortunately, what was found was that this was actually a posterior dislocation and this patient had been out for almost six week, six weeks and was lodged in this position. So again, proper diagnosis, even with a simple AP x-ray to know that if it looks like you have that little bit of overlap and no external rotation, that your mind needs to go to the posterior dislocation that was missed. And why is it important to uh, figure out all this is because what's the ramification of an unstable shoulder? Well, Hovelius showed us about 40% of these will go on to arthritic changes, even if they only have 18% recurrence. And so if you imagine a patient who's 15 years old with a dislocation, Imagine seeing them 15 years later with this shoulder at age 40. This is a big problem. So if we can stabilize them at an earlier age, I think it's important to take care of this as soon as possible. While we're doing this, I think it's necessary to uh, look at how do we diagnose this instability and is there a way to start building a simple criteria to figure out if these fall into which bucket of treatment. And Itoy started doing this a few years back talking and uh, introducing the glenoid tract. And why the glenoid tract is important, it's the zone of contact between the glenoid and the humeral head. And if we can figure out how much humerus, uh, or excuse me, how much glenoid we need, which is roughly 84% uh, of the glenoid width is what's going to be allowing us to have a stable shoulder. These, this further uh, will help us with our understanding of bipolar loss. It may not all be a problem on the glenoid. It may also be on the humeral side. Over the years, we've really truly looked at the glenoid, but I think as uh, the glenoid track will show us, we have to take into account the humerus. And you have to take account into the Hillsack's lesion and the more medial that injury and that lesion, that the more likely it will engage. And it's also important to note, it's usually the shallow wide Hillsack's that are gonna be more detrimental than the narrow, uh, very kind of sharp, deep ones. It's, uh, you can see this one on the left here that the, the more immediately it goes, there's a high likelihood that you're gonna get some type of instability. And when you look at the glenoid tract, if the hill sex is less than the glenoid tract, it's an on-track, non-engaging hill sex lesion. This is probably gonna be more amenable to a bank heart repair. But if the hill sex lesion is greater than the glenoid tract, this is where we're gonna start seeing the off-track lesions. And these are gonna be more predictable, likely to be treated with some type of bone block procedure. So these on track, you can see here on the left, you can see that the glenoid completely covers the hillsack. So this is an on track lesion. Whereas here, whether it's because of the glenoid or the humerus, it's going to engage. And when we start seeing those, this is when we need to make some determination of what is the appropriate treatment. And we'll get into some of those options shortly. Again, I'll simplify it once more. If you have a pothole like we do here in Michigan, you wanna make sure your tire completely covers that pothole versus the alternative when you have a very big uh, pothole and the actual whole car doesn't fit in. So we wanna make sure that where that humerus tracks over the glenoid, it completely covers the, the bone loss. So when we look at simply at a uh, glenoid here, we wanna see that the bare area is pretty much central and that the distance from the back to the middle is the same from the middle to the front. If we start seeing that, whether it be on x-ray or CT or MRI, or even in the operating room, we have to be careful with doing a soft tissue procedure. Is this something that we can see in the office? Well, yes. If you look at this article back in from 2010 from Gerber's group, you can see that he looked very closely at this anterior, anterior sclerotic rim. And if you started seeing that this anterior sclerotic rim here was wearing out, you had to really think hard about doing more testing. Uh, more testing could include CT, which is probably the most predictive because at this point, when you see that you have bone loss, you wanna look at the bone, uh, whether you have an MRI or not, uh, may not give you the true indication of how much bone loss you have. 
But again, he found that it was 100% specific for anterior bone loss. So get this in the, uh, in the office. I, I think it will really help you determine how much bone loss you really have. At the same time, the Bornejau view is very helpful. And if you go to my x-ray tech's office in both of my offices, you'll actually see these pictures. This is how they remember to take the appropriate uh, films. And it's important because again, you might be in the office, but it's only, all you need is the indication of there is bone loss so that you can ask for further imaging. And sometimes, especially here in the States, we have worries with the, uh, what we can obtain with insurance. They might all allow us one more test. If that test is an MRI, but it's really a bone problem, I would have chosen a CT scan. So I think it's necessary to get that brain working in the office to designate whether you really think this is a bone problem or a soft tissue problem. And from there, make the appropriate uh, further diagnostic testing that you need for the patient. And why is it important? Because if you think of even on, as the first time dislocator, 6.8% or called 7% of these patients have bone loss. But with recurrent dislocators, almost a quarter of the patients have some type of bone loss. It's different for each patient. Some may have a little, some may have a lot. But imagine that somebody who has recurrent dislocations, one in four of those patients has some type of bone loss. So the goal is to be a preservationist. We want to fix these early. We want to prevent the bone loss and the arthritic changes that come thereafter. Is there any predictors of bone loss? This was a great article back in uh, 2020. This actually won the Deer Award. Uh, bone loss was seen mostly on the posterior humeral head, the hill sacs, and then the anterior glenoid, and then combined about 20%. 81% of these uh, had an increase of bone loss with each additional dislocation. And again, patients with glenoid bone loss of greater than 10%, any athlete to dislocate a second time had a 257% more likely uh, problem to have more bone loss with more than one dislocation. So it's important that we really listen to our patients, get the appropriate testing, and really be prepared for having the appropriate treatment for their pathology. In past years, uh, this has been very helpful, the uh, instability severity index score. And again, it doesn't take a lot to get to a point where a bone block procedure is necessary. I think in past years here in the US, it was looked at that it was probably uh, too aggressive and that it really pushed everybody towards some bone block procedure. But I think the US is starting to catch up and realize that this is probably very close uh, to the true need of what these patients need from maybe changing that dogma of these soft tissue procedures towards a bone block procedure. So here's one of my cases. So at first glance, it looks like you can see everything looks okay, but then you start seeing the hill sacs there. As you come back around, you can see anterior bone loss. You can see this labrum, although there, even if I fix that, it's probably not the best uh, bone block for the patient, the glenoid, I should say. There's too much glenoid bone loss that even if I fix that labrum, it's probably not gonna give them the best outcome and likely to go on to fail. So here you go, as we externally rotate, you can see that this will engage and therefore an off-track lesion. And this patient went on to have an arthroscopic ladder gen. So going back to what we started talking about, looking at the glenoid, Boileau looked at this and said, this was about 25% was the indication for ladder gen. And so I think he was on the right track because he equated more on the glenoid side because we weren't really looking so much on the humeral side. But I think as we, we look at all this now and combine the two, I believe he was definitely on the right track and, and was appropriately treating these with bone block procedures. And again, what is that critical value? Over the past few years, it's come down. In 2017, we saw this great article, 17.3%. Then we saw in Tane Lee's group that it was 15%. And more recently with JT Tokish's group, it was 13.5%. So we see these numbers come down significantly and it's important because if we don't really take into consideration the bone loss and just presume every labral tear or every bank heart tear and instability is the same, we're probably gonna be treating too many patients with the wrong procedure. And now we've decided, let's go on to a coracoid transfer, but there's different options now. There's a European model, which is more of the inferior coracoid placed against the anterior glenoid versus the congruent arc. We use the medial coracoid placed against the anterior glenoid, utilizing its curvature to be flush with the bone and the cartilage. So therefore, essentially deepens the socket, but also gives you a congruent arc. De Beers' group looked at this and found that there's increased contact stress and pressure with the traditional ladder's egg. However, uh, 
the congruent arc, although flush with the glenoid, it decreases the contact forces, you're still using bone instead of cartilage at that level. The European indications, I put that in quotes, is they tend to be, or at least we once thought in the States that they're more aggressive. I think they're, they're right on. It's bone loss, anterior or posterior. It's a collision athlete with a primary dislocation. It's a revision of instability uh, from a previous soft tissue procedure. And if the patient has poor tissue or a poor capsule, this is where this is necessary to do the latter J, whether it be open or arthroscopic. And, you know, for me, uh, George Athol did a great job with this article. And I'm a big fan of the sling effect because it does aid in the stabilization of shoulders with moderate anterior bone loss. And it has this, uh, the chondroid tendon leads to this dynamic sling effect, especially with that arm and external rotation and abduction. So to me, the sling effect is important. Uh, an article a couple of years ago, also a near award-winning article did show, however, that it did not necessarily make a, a difference uh, in the overall stability of the shoulder. So with that being said, my colleague, uh, Dr. Ivan Wong in uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia, uh, had tried the uh, latter J. He is a lateral surgeon uh, and did not like the, to try to do the latter J arthroscopically in the lateral position. So he created the ant anatomic glenoid uh, re reconstruction. And what's nice about his is it's, a, I think, a little bit easier, whether you do it in a beach chair or uh, in a lateral position. It, you don't have to worry about the conjuring tendon. You actually can do this uh, very simply by just pulling the subscapularis down. There's no subscap split. And then once you have that bone appropriately aligned, then he, he'll bring the capsule to the uh, uh, paleoglenoid. And therefore, if uh, this doesn't give you enough stability, you still have the bone black anterior to this. So I think this is a great option. Uh, again, just a different option, but it, we're both saying the same thing, do something with uh, the bone and not just the soft tissue. In his uh, work, he found that he didn't have any neurovascular injuries, adverse effects, admission to hospitals, bleeding, infections, or implant failure in his initial paper. Uh, what he did show is that the full graft went on to union, and at this time he was using screws, and we'll get into that shortly. Um, his graft positioning was flush uh, in about 93% of uh, his cases, and he had excellent positioning vertically as well. One of the things he did note was resorption, and he saw about 87% had less than 50% resorption. And there's something to be said about that. It doesn't necessarily mean it's because of this procedure. It does, however, show that in the studies he's continuing to work on is really understanding what is the exact size he needs. Wolf's law is really uh, impactful here in the sense that if he puts too big of a graft, it is going to resorb to exactly what the body needs. So he has kept track of all the sizes of all his patients. And in time, he's going to be able to publish and show us how big of a piece of bone and cartilage we need for each patient. And I think it's going to allow to see less resorption. Again, he did show in his paper here that he did have higher resorption. However, there's no statistical significant difference uh, between the final surface area, the size of the grass, and the AP dimension of these reconstructed glenoids. Now, Let's look at ladder J versus bank cart repair. And I think many of these, as we look, uh, will, will be because over time, I think there is continued uh, instability because there was some glenoid bone loss and it could have been very subtle because somewhere around that two year mark, we really see this uh, big dip in how much, how many of these go on to fail. And when you looked at this study with a follow-up of about six years, there was this instability or apprehension in about 11% of the latter day patients versus 42% of the bank cards. And then overt instability, meaning they actually dislocated, was only 3% versus about 13% in the bank card group. So again, the bank card group was inferior to latter day and the difference so here was the quality of the outcomes decreased over time. You have to really make sure that you have enough bone. It's not to say that the bank card is a bad procedure. I just think that many of the, the bank cards that have been done, including many of my own, probably had some bone loss. And therefore we have to be very careful about really understanding the bone loss before moving forward with the bank card. And again, when you compare bank card to ladder J, the recurrence rate, you'll start seeing a, uh, a trend here. This is Boileau's group, 10%, the uh, ladder J group with about a quarter in the bank card group. Satisfaction was higher uh, with higher row scores in the latter day group and late recurrence were seen more in the high, we're considerably higher in the bank card group. Again, here, 
another very similar type uh, outcome, 12% recurrence, 21% bank cart, again, high row scores for the latter gen complications were about equal. And that seems to be one of the uh, things we keep hearing, but the latter gen has so many different uh, complications. But again, a complication can not just be a broken screw, it can be just continued recurrence in these patients. And although busy slide here, this was an interesting one because what it showed is recurrence, again, about 11%, bank card 21. We're starting to seeing a trend here. Post-surgical redose locations, about 5%. In the latter day group, bank card about 10%. No difference in complications with the latter day about 5%, bank card 3%. And then interestingly enough, the external rotation, this is a problem in patients with bank cards because we tighten that inferior capsule. Uh, we do uh, really uh, affect the external rotation for the patient. And in these patients, roughly, you can see about 12 degrees of loss of external rotation in the latter day group to about 21 degrees in the bank card group. And again, we see very similar findings with these borderline glenoid patients. These are about 15 to 20% bone loss. The clinical outcomes were the same with bank card versus latter day, but significantly lower recurrence and less external rotation limitations with the latter day patients. So even though we're not talking the 25% bone loss, we're talking towards that 15% bone loss uh, that we uh, saw earlier it's important that maybe a ladder J or some type of bone block procedure is the appropriate treatment. Busy slide, but within this, we do see that in ladder J, fewer recurrences, improved patient reported outcomes and more external rotation compared to that of bank card in this recent study. We'll start again, lots of trends will uh, we'll really pick up. These were our uh, first 46 patients treated arthroscopically uh, between December 15 and April 21 looking at external rotation at zero degrees and external rotation at 90 degrees at three months and six months. And then we looked at and compared to the, to their contralateral arm, as long as they didn't have any previous pathology or previous surgery. And what we did find is that there was a significant loss of only 5.11 uh, uh, degrees. So literally about five degrees at final follow-up uh, doing these external rotation uh, after uh, arthroscopic ladder jays. So is five degrees enough to say that that's still a significant amount or is it inconsequential? Well, depending on the patient in many of these, it was inconsequential comparatively speaking. And again, when you start uh, appreciating first time versus recurrent dislocations with ladder jay, one of the takeaways with this is that the number of pre-op dislocations does not truly affect the post-op instability rate after a ladder jay, but we'll get back to that shortly. And again, here, when you look at this study, high redislocation rates after arthroscopic revision, bank cart with poor patient reported outcomes compared to revision open ladder J. So if that patient needs a revision, a second uh, arthroscopic revision bank cart may not be the appropriate procedure. You got this level three study looking at group one of failed bank carts versus primary ladder J's. What was found here is a ladder J after it failed bank cart was not equal to a primary ladder J. Those patients actually did worse. So we have to be careful of the previous uh, thought process of the ladder J will come after a failed bank cart. And so we really need to understand going into surgery what the right procedure is so that we can appropriately treat them. Because if we know that the primary ladder J is going to do better than a revision from bank cart, and we need, we need to offer that to the patients appropriately. Get in this level three study as well. Uh, average age about 27 degrees. Uh, it, the salvage ladder J had a higher rate of recurrent instability. So it's important here, recurrent instability from a primary ladder J was 9.1% versus a salvage ladder J was 21%. So a prior failed banker has a higher fail rate after salvage ladder J. And then remplissage has been thought, well, maybe if there's just a, just a little bit of bone loss, maybe if we tied this in with the remplissage and pull that humeral head back and give it that restraint. But here you can also see that there's about a 12% redislocation rate at about five years. And, re and a remplissage is probably not the best uh, offering for a patient who's a thrower because about two thirds of these completed decreased range of motion as well as about 60% of them had problems throwing. So if you have a thrower, maybe remplissage isn't the best option for them. And again, when you do these, don't place them too uh, medial. And it does obviously know we, it restricts motion. So a little bit of internal rotation when tightening the knots is helpful as to not over tighten them. And as we continue, what about remplissage versus ladder J? Here you can see with these off track lesions of patients, um, you know, somewhere around 10 degrees, or excuse me, 10% yeah, bone loss. Similar clinical findings, but higher complication rate with the ladder J. However, the ladder J is a better choice for those collision athletes for just uh, for those uh, greater than 10% bone loss.
Alexander Lauterman uh, and Philippe Colon had this excellent uh, option as well. If you have a patient with, you know, roughly around 10 degrees, or excuse me, 10% of bone loss, tie in the, the um, long head of the biceps. And the way this works is you provide more stability by taking, in, in these just standard bank cards, you can augment by taking the biceps, making a small subscap split and attaching it in the anterior portion of the uh, glenoid. So essentially what you're trying to do here is uh, make a sling. And with this dynamic anterior stabilization, it's, it showed that it can significantly help by uh, uh, significantly less reactive anterior translation in patients with 10% glenoid defects. Uh, and so if you have a patient that maybe doesn't fully need a bone block, but is maybe a little bit of bone loss right around 10%, maybe adding the biceps will be helpful in these patients. So one of the issues that we often hear when you talk about ladder shades, what about all the complications? Well, looking at 200 uh, open ladder shades with the Rothman group, uh, 15 complications were seen within the first 90 days, about 9% of patients, most of them being graft failure uh, and some were nerve injury. Uh, and so here we saw about two thirds of those issues with complications were because of graft failure. Was it positioning? Was it the uh, screws? Was it the buttons? Was it the trajectory of the screws? And one of the things that was found out, fixation with one screw increases screw divergence angle. Uh, both were predictors of graft failure. And then if you were too long posteriorly with that screw, then it could injure the uh, suprascapular nerve at the spinal glenoid notch. Um, my dear friend, Matt Ravenscroft, uh, was nice enough to give me some of his information and then it was later published. Uh, but comparatively speaking, arthroscopic ladder jade to open ladder jade, uh, comparing this one to uh, JP Warner's group that, uh, published back in 2012. In theirs, they saw roughly 6% infection where in the arthroscopic zero, transient nerve injury, about 9% versus 1%, permanent nerve injury, 4% versus zero. And the redislocation rate was significantly decreased between 8% to 1.6%. So CT planning is very helpful. Uh, and Hardy did an excellent job in this paper showing us, is there a way that we can maybe assess how long the screws have to be ahead of time? And so one of the things was shown here is if you figured out the width of, excuse me, the height of your coracoid in the CT and also this position here in the glenoid where you would like to put your screws, which is about seven millimeters from the joint and at a, roughly about 20 degrees. And you add those two, it'll give you a pretty good indication of where that screw length should be. Because more than five millimeters from the tip to the screw to the posterior cortex was predictive of the suprascapular nerve injury. And when we see those, you can see that if you take that into account, you can actually be much closer and obviously less than the five millimeters that we need by using this uh, very simple CT scan tip. And again, our complications within our first 51, uh, minimum six month follow-up, we had an overall uh, revision rate of about 7% uh, for these uh, four total patients. Most common was coracoid graft loosening or non-union. Uh, one patient here in this x-ray did fall and post op day, day zero coming home from the hospital and needed a revision. Uh, and so you have to be careful, but at the same time, as you get better with doing this procedure, whether arthroscopic or open, you'll see that although there is a learning curve, your complication rate will come down. 75% of my complications were within the first 25 patients that I did. This uh, was recently discussed at the ANA meeting in San Francisco a few weeks ago, and there's been this big push to start using buttons because maybe screws are problematic, uh, as we just discussed. And so Ivan Wong, again, I thank him for uh, these slides, but screw fixation has better patient reported outcomes than button fixation for arthroscopic anatomic clinic reconstruction with distal tibial allograft when he matched this cohort. And he wanted to compare two-year data with screws versus the buttons. And when you look at his uh, population of roughly 18 patients in each, very similar, no significant differences between the two groups. One thing, however, was there was a higher failure rate with the buttons. You saw 39% failed in the button group and had recurrent instability, and the same 39% needed a revision procedure. So although there was an 11% uh, revision in the screw group, it was actually just to remove the screws, but they actually all remained stable. So we need to be careful. And in some of these patients, he actually saw complete resorption of the graft uh, in the button group. 
And that's what he saw here. And what he took away was maybe possibly it had something to do with the size of the glenoids. Um, and so here he saw that the smaller glenoids tended to have the failed buttons. So be careful on those patients. But it was difficult to assess if they truly had enough compression to lead to healing of the bone block. And so in many of the cases that he saw in those 39%, there was very little, if any, of the graft left behind. As you can see here, he had these that where he only saw at 24 months, only saw the buttons, but at four months, they looked really good. And then they went on to fail. So they needed a revision procedure. So when you're looking at graft position, whether it be an anatomic um, bone block, which is gonna be flush versus a ladder J, which is going to be about four millimeters medialized in line with the subchondral uh, bone and not the cartilage. You need to make sure you're perfectly positioned these because that's gonna make all the difference. So we don't wanna to be too medial. And we don't want to be too lateral. We want it to be just right. And how can we do that? Well, again, uh, these, uh, this article by Hardy uh, did show that in his 51 patients uh, doing them arthroscopically, he found that he actually felt that he had a better position. The CT's post-op also showed this. Uh, you can have um, better lateral positioning towards the subchondral bone and not too medial. And also from uh, superior to inferior, better positioning as well. And what does it look like later? This was a patient I did have to take a uh, screw out and this was what time zero. And you can see that it does fill with some fiber cartilage. And that's why it's important to make sure that you're with the subchondral bone and not all the way to the cartilage if you're doing a, a ladder J, whether it be arthroscopic or open. And here we see that the graft is here. And what do they look like throughout their recovery? At two weeks, a little bit of forward flexion here, abduction, a little bit of internal rotation. I only keep them in a sling for about uh, four weeks. I start their therapy at two weeks. Here they are at six weeks. She has good for uh, good elevation, good abduction. You can definitely see that there is a difference. She's still a little bit captured in that shoulder. And you can see she doesn't have as much external rotation, but by 12 weeks with continued therapy, almost equal and symmetric external rotation, forward flexion, abduction, and then external rotation at uh, 90 degrees and also behind your back. In that same article by Hardy, uh, we noted that arthroscopic versus mini open also required a significantly less amount of narcotic use. Uh, here in the States, we have a big problem with opiate um, ab abuse as well as opiate addiction. And therefore, uh, when you look here with a, just using acetaminophen, tramadol, naproxen, uh, and something to help with the uh, stomach for uh, concerns of uh, ulcers, they found that these patients required significantly less narcotics than those in the open group. And then whether you're doing it arthroscopic or open, I switched in 2015 to doing it arthroscopically and 51 patients uh, were the ones we looked at. The first uh, 25, again, had the highest complication rate, which we showed was about uh, four, excuse me, three in the first uh, 25 and one in the second 26. But again, it was consistent with the literature with Lauterman and Bonneville, Getz and LaFosse. So if this is something that you want to see or do, I think there's plenty of uh, surgeons around the world. I was uh, lucky enough to go see LaFosse and Ravenscroft to, and Athwal and Favorito uh, to allow me to learn how to do this amazing procedure, which has been very helpful in my armamentarium for instability. And you can also see that after the 25, uh, my time came down, not that it's based on time, but if I'm more efficient, I know that there's less likely chance of uh, complications. I went from about 115 minutes to about 82 minutes. And so in these patients here, now that we've stabilized these patients, how, how do they get back to sport? Well, here you can see 47 patients, uh, roughly about age 25, minimum two-year follow, but 90% of these patients return to sport, but be careful of the overhead athletes and the martial arts uh, patients. They tend to have a lower return to sport than the non-collision, non-overhead athletes. Again, when you're looking at classic versus congruent arc, does it make a difference in their return? Uh, overall, about 87% return to sports, 92% return at about the same level of those. But again, no significant differences between the groups and return to sport, the range of motion, uh, and then their scores as well. And the recurrence rate was uh, very similar between groups. So it's, I think, again, 
there's multiple ways to uh, help these patients, but I think it's really important to make sure that if the patient needs a bony procedure, they get a bony procedure. Should return to sport after ladder shake here. Again, overall rate to return was about 88.8% .8 with about 72% returning to the same level. Uh, with this player over here that did return to a high level of sports after uh, having a ladder shake procedure. Again, going back to what about if they've had a previous bank cart? You can see that it's a little bit higher if they get their, uh, it's significantly higher if they get a primary uh, ladder J. And you can see ladder J after failed bank cart about 64%, return to sport primary ladder J after primary instability, 88%. And then primary ladder J after recurrent instability was even higher at 91%. And then again, percent return to sport at the same level on an average of about four, uh, four and a half months. Over at athletes again in martial arts, just be careful of those. Uh, so that's now two patients or two uh, studies we've seen that. And how do you test to see if they're ready? For me at three months, I'll get a CT scan. And if I can see that the graft is fully incorporated at least 75%, then I will let them go and return to sport. Again, looking at arthroscopic coracoid transfers here, um, comparing to open, the revision rate was uh, lower with utilizing CT scan uh, to assess the, if there was a union. Zero in the arthroscopic group, about 3% in the open group. Uh, there was, however, a slightly decreased uh, external rotation loss in the open group, uh, but no difference at abduction and external rotation. And again, no difference in recurrence. CT evaluation, again, looking at non-union rates, the open group had about 12%, arthroscopic group about 2%. Graft osteolysis was seen more in the open group than the arthroscopic. Graft uh, fracture rates, uh, very similar. And then placement from the three to five o'clock or even two to five o'clock position. Um, it, it's interesting, if you looked at the three to five, uh, there was a difference, but if they looked at the two to five, which means you have a bigger graft, uh, there was no difference. And this is an interesting video that, again, uh, my friend Matt Ravenscroft gave me. This was one of his players here. And you can see that as he comes through, here he comes. He's about to catch it. And he came down pretty hard on that shoulder. But what he did is he, he, sent, he sent Matt this, uh, this note, and he said, um, this okay sign was actually for Matt telling him that this that after that fall, after that hard slam that he took with the elbow and shoulder, he was doing okay. And he was actually three and a half months out from his arthroscopic ladder shake. So you can see, you can come back to a very high level of sports and you actually take a, a pretty good hit and that, will, that shoulder will remain stable. So in summary, I think it's important when seeing these patients as they are seeing us and we need to make sure we're seeing them that we have appropriate workup, a good CT, a good MRI if we, if we can. We really need to take into account on track versus off track. We need to make sure that we're aware that 13 and a half percent of bone loss may be all that is necessary for a bony procedure. A first time dislocation in a younger patient, it's important that we fix these uh, acutely, especially if they're a collision athlete. And again, I've given you many different options with bone uh, to utilize. I think that one of those is probably the appropriate uh, treatment. So, so we might argue and say that a free bone block is fine, or it's, you need the sling because you have the coracoid. We might discuss that the coracoid needs to be positioned this way versus that way with the uh, congruent arc versus the uh, traditional but we're actually all saying the same thing. It's very similar to the biceps tenodesis conversation. We're all saying, do something with the bone. And so I, I ask you to continue to learn as I have, and I know I have a lot, of, lot to go, uh, but I think that there is a position here where we're probably not doing enough of these bone block procedures, at least here in the States. And I think we're gonna start seeing that change. And I think we're gonna give our patients better outcomes because of it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bishai, for that very comprehensive presentation. Every slide has so much of information. It does. Sometimes they're pretty busy slides, I won't lie. Yeah, I'm sure because it, uh, it works as a very strong archive. Someone wants to check out later, they can go through it. Uh, just a few questions from our side. Now, sure. there are some surgeons who believe in a three-dimensional MRI. For example, some surgeons have looked at that, and so you can avoid a CT. You can avoid 
because invariably you need a CD to look at the bone loss and you need an MR to look at the soft tissues. So what is your take on that? A three-dimensional MRI so that you can avoid a CD? I, I think if the if the information is very similar, uh, I think, yeah, that would be fine. I don't have the opportunity to get a 3D MRI at this time. So for me, if I know a patient has multiple dislocations and maybe I see that anterior sclerotic line uh, is missing on the x-ray, then I will go to the CT scan if I'm only allowed one. I think that gives me presently more information. Um, but at the same time, if, if the MRI was able to give me both the soft tissue information and the bone loss information with such as a 3D MRI, I think that'd be a, a very valuable uh, tool as well as you'll decrease the radiation exposure to the patient. Thank you, Dr. Bishai. And there's a lot of emphasis on the subcritical bone loss, right? Like one, you said, one of the most recent papers say that 13.5% is the cutoff. And if you do a bone block, if it's less than 13.5, there is a possibility of graft resorption, isn't it? I think so. And, and I think it's, again, Wolf's Law, the body is going to keep what it needs. And one of the things I think we're starting to realize is, you know, we have these on track, off track. There's some new conversations of near track because it's almost off track. So these are these, these subcritical bone loss. I think we don't really know what to do with it. And so that's why I applaud Dr. Lauderman and, and Dr. Cologne for coming up with maybe the, adding the biceps to it, giving it a sling effect. But at the same time, um, you, you're starting to see more studies with the subcritical with bone, whether it be bone block or coracoid. So I, I think that we're seeing that shift. And I think we have to be really careful of just looking at the numbers on the uh, glenoid. And that's what we've done in years past and really take into the on-track, off-track because you might still need a bone procedure, even though you'd have maybe 5% bone loss on the glenoid, but you have a lot of injury on the humeral head. And what's the right answer there? What do you do with that? Is, is that a remplissage in a bank card? Is that a bone block and a remplissage? It, it's hard to tell. We don't know. I think that's that gray area that we're, we're still learning, but it's, it's becoming more evident that we need more bone block procedures um, at roughly around that 13 to 15 or just simply looking at off track. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bisha. And I think the biggest debate that's going to happen is when you have a glenoid versus, plus a humeral head loss, is it the bipolar lesion? Mm -hmm. And that is where our on track and off track really helps. And what are the options that we have? Suppose it is off track and there is a significant humeral defect. What are your options? Is it remplissage or what do you, what do you have? So for me, it, it really depends. If it's a bigger, uh, wider, maybe shallow, that might be, I think if you do a, uh, if you have a healthy piece of bone in front, whether it be bone block or uh, coracoid, I think you can get away with not having to do much to that. The concern, however, is when you get those deeper, uh, those ones, and actually I tend to just do a bone graft there. I, I do a small incision in the back and, uh, and sneak through that posterior capsule. Uh, and I've used, if there's humeral head allograft available, I'll use that, but talus actually works very well uh, to, to fit those. And I use a, a headless compression screw to hold those in place. So that restores the humeral head, but I've also taken care of the bone loss in the front as well. And what's the role of an iliac crest bone graft? Well, at one point of time, there's a lot of emphasis on the ICBG, but off late with the availability of uh, allograft and a lot of options, uh, people have almost, almost gone into disfavor. But do you think there's a definite role for it? I think, you know, one of the biggest issues is uh, donor site morbidity. The last thing you want is a stable shoulder with a hip that hurts. Uh, mm -hmm. So actually, coracoid autograft has, you know, or excuse me, Coracoid autograph is the obvious, but clavicle, distal clavicle uh, autograph has been helpful in some of these as well. And I think that also with the iliac crest, it, our biggest concern with allograft was, uh, was bone loss resorption. And I think what we're seeing now with better techniques, maybe better screws that give compression is that you're not seeing that resorption as much. And so I think by not needing to take an autograph, now, if you're in an area of the world that doesn't have an allograft option, I think it is a great option for these patients. So the patient can offer you either distal clavicle or iliac crest because you just need something to deepen the, deepen the, uh, the glenoid to have that humeral head register better.
Thank you, Dr. Bisha. Just one last question before we wind up. There's a question on the chat box by Dr. Mazimul Siddiqui. And the question goes like this. How do you measure HSI, the Hillsacks interval on CT, as it is from medial insertion point of supraspinatus? How will you see supra insertion on CT, basically? So on the CT, what I will do is I will get the CT scan and ask for 3D reconstructions with humeral and scapular subtraction. So when you take that humeral head in space, you can actually measure the size. Um, I've actually gone as far as giving the glenoid track uh, article to the radiologist I use. Mm -hmm. So they will actually calculate that for me. And they actually find it quite fun because they're, they obviously know that they're making a decision for the treatment of this patient. So I'll get it back and it will measure the hill sacs, it will measure the glenoid and they'll sell me at 78%. I already know what I'm doing at that point. I don't, I don't have to really think, it just drops into the bucket that it needs. So uh, to answer the question, I think you can measure it very um, predictably on the CT scan. I will, however, tell you that there are multiple articles that the CT scans will underestimate bone loss. So if you're on that border of 83% on the glenoid tract, you're probably less than that when you get inside that shoulder. So be prepared because for me, I do my bank carts in a lateral position and I do the arthroscopic ladder shades in a beach chair. So it's important for me to know going in good measurements of these so that I can make good decisions so I can have the patient in the correct position when I'm in the operating room. Thank you, Dr. Bisha. I think that's all the questions that we have for the session. Thank you for this fantastic presentation. I'm sure this is going to benefit a lot of people. I appreciate it. And I thank you so much for allowing me to come on Orthopedic Principles. It's been great. Goodbye.